This month's Where Did the Road Go is sponsored by Allison Cook, Super Inframan, and Stephen St. George. If you would like to help support the show, become a patron. WhereDidTheRoadGo.com. It's only $3 a month. Lots of extra content all month long. And now, our show. Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. Welcome to this edition of Where Did the Road Go? And tonight I have with me... Hmm, where do I start? Uh, Super Inframan. Hello, hello. Christopher Ernst. Howdy there. And Taylor Bell. Hey. See, I included your last name this time. (laughs) No more just Taylor for you. (laughs) Perfect. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) So tonight, we're going to kind of... Taking a hint from the Snake Brothers, they'll they'll take a book and and, kind of go through it. Um, we're going to not do it quite the way they do it because they'll, they'll read almost the entire book. A lot of times, uh, they're currently doing the book of the damned from Charles Fort. Mm. And, and I think they have eight, three hour parts so far. I think there's, it's up to nine now. Is it, it up to nine? Up. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> we're not going to quite do that, but I have, uh, <laughs> this book from Brad Steiger called strange disappearances. And it's uh, kind of a rare one from him. It uh, costs a, a fortune on Amazon. I picked it up at a used bookstore for, let's see, what is what is the price on there? $3. And it sells for, like I believe, last time I checked, hundreds on Amazon. So mine's, mine's kind of beat up and weathered, but uh, it's, it's an interesting book. It's not just missing people. It says in the cover, um, Brad Steiger explores the astonishing powers behind the strange disappearances which have baffled mankind through the centuries. So I figure we'll pull some stories out of this and talk about it. Um, actually the back and, and, uh, the back is kind of interesting. So the back says the forest of vanishing children on Sunday morning, August 6, 1956, 13 year old Donald Lee Baker of Azusa, California set off on a bicycle ride with his 11 year old friend, Brenda Howell. When the children had not returned by that evening, the police were notified. Their bicycles were found in heavy brush near the reservoir at the edge of the Angolese national forest. Navy di- divers were commissioned to search the deep body of water while police, sheriff's deputies, and hundreds of volunteers scoured the area. No trace of the children was ever found. During the next four years, three more children were to vanish in the same forest area, vanish forever. Wow. There was no evidence no, of foul play, no sign of their bodies or belongings. One of the children walked around a bend in the trail just ahead of six members of his family and was never seen again. And I'm sure David probably covered that in one of his books. Um, I, I was going to say, it kind of sounds like a missing 411 situation. Yeah. Of course, this was published in 1972. So, Right, yeah. Oh, that's, that stuff is, is, is fascinating to me. Um, you know, as an aside, the first thing it actually reminded me of was Stranger Things. Sure. Uh, yeah, because it, they they even have like a quarry scene where they they stage uh, was it Will I think uh, his body, um, but that whole show pulls on so much forty and yeah uh, and, and everything else that you know makes up stuff we're interested in. Um, wow, and hopefully this next last season of Stranger Things will not include a sing along of the Never Ending Story. <laughs> hopefully not hopefully not hopefully <laughs> though it does have a uh, uh they are like fully leaning into the dungeons and dragons thing and the big bad is like a legit dungeons yep. and dragons character from the original gary gygax really yeah, i've heard it's is yeah it, is it's it vecna? vecna yeah it's okay. vecna oh is it really i mean yeah i mean they're probably like adapting it in the same way they did the mind flayer but Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're like straight up calling, you know, the the if people are not familiar, uh Vecna is a uh, uh notorious uh lich, so you know, a a uh, undead sorcerer oh, in, okay. in yep. Dungeons and Dragons, yeah. Well, that should be oh, interesting. Cool. Yeah. I mean, yeah, they pulled so much different the Montauk project and all that stuff is mixed in there. Yeah. I wish I kind of wish there was more Montauk. I mean, I know that, you know, Montauk is kind of a uh, uh who is it? Uh, 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 not Phil Schneider, the guy um, 
Think of the other guy, uh, mm. the um, <laughs> Morris K. Jessup. No, the guy, the Philadelphia Experiment guy. Oh, oh, Alinde. Uh, 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 yes, Carlos Sandy. I know. I was just listening to uh, uh, the Saucer Life stuff about it. Yeah, Didn't, yeah. You said uh, some stuff. Wasn't it sort of his lineage that ended up with Montauk? I don't know. I, I, yeah. I think so, but you know, I, I know it more from Phil Schneider than anybody else. Right. Right. Uh, well, I guess maybe I'm thinking of the line of Carlos Yende to Phil Schneider, which is, you know, I mean, <laughs> kind of everything leads leads up that way. But yeah. Yeah. You know, so what's interesting is I, I'd love like to find out the circumstances, if there was any physical evidence at all of like how the children disappeared in the uh, Steiger account there. Um, yeah, apparently there's no evidence of anything. Of anything, just found their bicycle. Yeah, they're just gone. Uh, that, that that is interesting to me. What it would also be interesting to find out if you could do research on the area and if any other uh, odd things had happened around there. Right, other than missing um, people. Yeah, yeah. So I this just crossed my mind maybe like two weeks ago, but you know we had talked about on the show in Devil's Den, Arkansas, where uh, a girl had been lost for three or four days, had the the experience of like the person that was with her that helped her. And then soon as she was found, that person was gone. Mm-hmm. And then recently a young girl got lost and a little girl was with her, you know, while she was gone. Really? And, uh, so that, that had happened. But what I remembered since we had talked about that on, on one of our listener stories shows, I think, and we were looking at articles, Terry Lovelace, uh, wrote his whole account uh, is set where he got abducted camping with a friend in devil's den. Mm. Um, and it, everything that he uh, says happened around him centers around that abduction experience uh, in devil's den, Arkansas. And I'm like, man, that place must be weird as all get out now abducted by aliens. Yes. Yes. Abducted by aliens. Um, you know, and, and it's very, uh, it's a very nuts and bolts story. Um, he and the guy that he went camping with, they were both in the uh, armed forces, worked together, somehow got the urge that they were going to drive down from, uh, I believe the Air Force Base was in Missouri, down into Arkansas to go to this park and camp. And it was something that neither of them had ever had an interest in before. Um, and then they, as they were camping, they drove a very, very deep in supposedly beyond where the, you were supposed to be allowed to be, mm. uh, wh- whatever that means. I, I, I don't know, but, uh, black triangle aircraft type thing shows up. There's, you know, something like grays walking around on the ground oh, and, uh, like they hole. initially try to hide, but they get found. Yeah. I kind of remember this story. Yeah, yeah, and it, he he had a recurring experience where it seemed like uh, I say recurring experience. It was seemed like the military knew what had happened to him and wanted him to tell them, basically verify what they already knew, and then also get him to say he would never tell anybody about it. So I, I, I find it very interesting. He even at the end of the book, I think, talks about. The one of the aliens he'd met on board the spacecraft, like disguising herself or disguising herself as a woman, disguising itself as a, a female, and like sitting in his house talking to him late one night with her wig on and her hat and things like that. It's very interesting, very bizarre. Huh. But but all that is to say, I would love to find out if other weird stuff happened where these children disappeared. You know, it's yeah, yeah right. I would too. I mean, it's right north of uh, uh, like the city of Los Angeles. Um, uh-huh. It's in the the hills, like above uh, West Covina, if you know anything about it. So, I mean, if you know anything about Los Angeles, yeah, it's sprawling. Um, mm-hmm. So, uh, you know. It is, even though it is in the Los Angeles County um, and near the city of Los Angeles, it's not exactly in the city. But yeah, it's right there. I mean, a- Angeles National Forest is the one that's like right north uh, of Los Angeles. Hmm. Um, well, you know, so much strange stuff happens out that way. I- I'm pulling up West Covino on the map here so I can kind of look at it. Because, uh, you know, you had all that interesting, like, <laughs> I-, I keep going back to like the, the, uh, 
Mendocino uh, Triangle. Uh, Mendocino Triangle, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, which was yeah. where everybody grew marijuana, and you had yeah. like the Back to Earthers and the right. uh, motorcycle gangs suddenly yeah. finding themselves working together, and uh, all kinds yeah. of people disappeared there. But you know, you can understand pretty quickly why they disappeared. Right. Yeah. It, w- it was a dangerous business. Uh, this is different. All right. Yeah, that's um, interesting. So let me get into one of the things I marked off on here in the actual book. I mean, that's in the book somewhere too, but um, mm-hmm. so right, right in the sure. beginning, he says that uh, he talks about some missing people that were found. Uh, and he basically says that he, in this book, we shall not be interested in accounts of runaway husbands, uh, wandering ad- adolescents seeking kind of a Peter Pan paradise <laughs> away from their parents, irresponsible creditors. Uh, law violators, manufacturing disappearances to evade legal authorities, etc. Um, the strange disappearances of which this book shall concern itself is will not be those of the disillusioned, the disgruntled, or the disassociated, but rather of those individuals who were, from all outward signs and appearances, completely absorbed in their work or their families, fully mm-hmm. occupied with living the joy of life, eager to go about the business of living. And he says, men such as Charles F. Holden, a retired paint contractor from Oakland, California, who accompanied his son and brother-in-law on a week-long hunting trip in October 1964. While the other men planned to hunt, Holden had decided he would be content to paint and sketch. The three men stopped on a highway east of Crescent City, California at 2 p.m. on October 11th. While the two younger men began to scout the area for gain, game, the 78-year-old Charles Holden set up his sketching board. Albert, his son, glanced back at him as they started off on the trail. The older man was sketching vigorously. That was the last image his son would have of him. When the two younger men returned approximately 45 minutes later, they found absolutely no trace of Charles Holden. There was not a cigarette butt, a discarded sheet of sketching paper, or even a smear of pastel to prove that he had even been there. Sheriff's deputies and forestry of officials conducted an extensive search of the area without finding a trace of the man. Deputy David Greenberger was, I'm sorry, Grenbammer was quoted as saying it is physically impossible for him to have for him to be up there. If he had fallen into the brush or had wandered away any distance, we would have found him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That is, I think Crescent City's further up north. I don't know if that's in the uh, the Mendocino Triangle. Or, no, I think it's actually almost up by Oregon, if I remember correctly. It might be. Let me, uh, I'm going to put that in uh, the maps here, too. I mean, all of these, and if I'm correct about it being, I think it's in you know a, a pretty heavily forested area um all of these i always you know go back to the the sort of the the, i get the the big question of whether like not we can ever know if any of these things you know were just sort of a freak accident because of the remote nature of where they happened um right right yeah yeah i i had a friend that uh uh her boyfriend at the time this is you know, 20 years ago was out camping with his best friend and the best friend got up late at night, uh, to go relieve himself. And he stepped off the edge of a cliff cause he, oh. yeah, you know, yep. And, uh, it, it took them a while to find him, but they found him and that's, that's what happened. Yeah. And that's uh, the thing. They did find him. They, they did, did find him. Yeah. And so that, that's the difference. Right. right. Um, yeah. but sometimes bad things happen out in these places that, uh, are just freak accidents, but, you know, I also weird things happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, they do. It's yeah, weird yeah. though when there's no trace at all. I mean, yeah, right. That's a little strange. Sure. Or when the behavior was strange. I mean, that's yeah. Yeah. All right. So the next, actually the next one right in the list here, he says, uh, women such as Mrs. Joe Sanchez, a 45 year old Texas housewife who accompanied her husband and three sons on a fishing trip to Port Arkansas on March 10th, 1968. Which Mrs. Sanchez vanished without a trace when the rest of her family went back to the car to find a misplaced item. When they returned to the spot where they had left her, they discovered to their sorrow and horror that the wife and mother had been become misplaced forever. A 10 day search failed to turn up the slightest clue as to her disappearance. Wow. And that's just like what, well, you know, that doesn't, I don't know. You don't even know what yeah. to think when there's nothing. There's yeah. nothing at all. Right. right. You know, the, the my brain always goes two places on these because it's 
obviously, depending on the people involved, did they have uh, another life that they wanted to live and just could completely keep that sequestered and that had to arrange for somebody to come get them? Or, you know, we talk about how strange stuff happens when you're alone and in the woods. It, you know, you would sort of almost invite the Oz effect to take yeah. place. And, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, how many uh, encounters, experiencers, abductions do we know start with? Uh, I was up late in the woods one night. Um, yeah. You know, <laughs> Red Pill got a, a a real chuckle when I was telling him about my grandfather was out catfishing, you know, when he saw the ball of fire come down and the lady step out of it. And uh, he was like, how many people get abducted <laughs> or or have experiences like that? Like, it's so ubiquitous. Uh, well, there's something about that, about being out in that, you know, in nature or just by yourself in the dark or at night. Yeah. It will. It reminds me of Jeff Ritzman's method. I mean, yeah, that is that is his method. You know, yeah. you go to the same place every night, no matter what, you know, and, and here's, uh, same time. Yeah. Here, here's something to, to add to that, um, Chris. I, I'm glad you said that because, you know, he would talk about, you know, you're creating this ritual. And I wonder, you know, when you have national parks and things like that where people intentionally go to camp, uh, even though you may have only done the ritual of preparing to go to this spot one time, hundreds of other people have done that same thing before you. Mm. And so you're still sort of <laughs> stacking the ritual Sure. On top of these other experiences, yeah, that built up kind of energy. Mm. Yeah, yeah, like it, it, I, I don't know. I, I just thought about that now. I'm like, for I sure, see that playing into it though, uh, because that that does sound like something Jeff would describe too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and to kind of jump back to something you said, uh, you know, there is there's definitely cases where people do run away or have you know they. they go and i don't know join another family or, or whatever but it sounds right. like with with this case and i i think um you know brad's uh kind of quip there at the beginning about right. what types of stories these are uh, the problem is we just don't know right we we don't have any context for you know what this guy was doing or what his life was like or anything right. it sounds yeah. like i mean based on what we have it sounds like he w was not in that situation. You right. Know what I mean, yeah, like yeah. neither, neither yeah. of these people were in that situation. They were, they were out just having a nice, nice day with their families. Right. Right. right yeah. All right. So the next one here, um, says men such as captain Charles G. Reed of the more McCormick lines, luxury liner, Argentina, who vanished from his cabin at 3 AM on October 31st, 1968. Although his disappearance has been officially dismissed as a suicide, <clears throat> and the facts of the case have been bent and distorted to fit such a pronouncement. The approved explanation for his death at sea raises more questions than it answers. The tabloid Midnight ran an article by a reporter who claimed to have done a great deal of legwork finding passengers and crew willing to talk about the officer's strange disappearance. The journalist's job of reportage, if it is not a purely sensationalist, uh, sensational fabric fabrication, Quotes men and women complete with their names, addresses, and places of employment who claim that the Argentina had been paced by a UFO on that evening. The captain, according to this story, walked about assuring the passengers that the UFO was some kind of electrical illusion. Later, so insisted witnesses, a oh. UFO was seen to hover outside the captain's windows. Oh, Wow. And now we have introduced a bizarre element into the subject that is yep. already teeming with mysterious components. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. Mm, I love it. And of course, UFO, I mean, could it just be a ball of plasma as well? It doesn't describe the UFO. Mm -hmm. Right. <clears throat> and he described it as an electrical phenomena, which it may very well have been. Yeah, yeah. That ball of plasma, ball lightning, things like that. But Yeah, it sounds like light. Yeah, and I always wonder too, like, uh, if I were to touch ball lightning, uh, would it just incinerate me? Right. I mean, I, I don't know, but it seems like, man, that's an awful lot of electrical energy. <laughs> you yes. know what's interesting about that, though, and maybe correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but you know, aside from like tic tacs and stuff like that, 
Um, are there a ton of like, uh, uh, you know, UFOs spotted at sea? Yes. Oh yeah. 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 And, and oh. even some that are, um, I either call them USOs, right? Yes. You know, uh, well, USOs I'm familiar with. Right. But sure. Um, uh, I'm just trying to think of other cruise ship sightings that I've ever heard of before. Uh, you know, so I haven't heard as many cruise ship sightings. Yeah. But, I mean, you know, plenty you, of military. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, no. You're, you're fine, Chris. But yeah, plenty of military. And then, you know, the experience of like saying almost fire and things like that are very. Well, you know, that I'm. Yeah, that that's okay. what I was kind of thinking of is, you know, um, right. So there's definitely uh, some precedent for that, for sure. Yeah. And you also get those mirages off in the horizon. I yeah. can't remember what they're called, but oh yeah, those are so often cool. Fade yeah, it, it sounds like from the accounts though that people are saying that this was like stalking him. Yeah, <laughs> interesting. Yeah. And when, yeah, and it was. Yeah, and he's telling really people, "Don't worry about it. <laughs> it's not. Don't real. worry about this UFO that's following me around. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to see here. No biggie. It's, it's cool. So, weird. <laughs> so were you talking about the fate of Morgana? Yes. Okay. That's it. Yeah. That's what I was thinking of is Fe- Feta Morgana and Sanimals. Yeah. Fire. Um, there's also uh, in Contiki, he talks about the, um, when he did his Pacific voyage from South America to, where was he? Yes. Was, was it Southeast Asia he was aiming for? Mm-hmm. Somewhere over there. Um, and j- they just took like the raft and, and did it. And yeah. at some point they're in the middle of the Pacific Ocean and this glowing thing comes up underneath them. Yeah. Well, aren't oh, there, well, aren't there, I remember reading a, uh, uh, an article about this. I don't know if it was, uh, Miguel or red pill that wrote it, but I think it was in the daily grail. It was talking about, uh, and I could be wrong if it's Tahitian sailors, there are, uh, these really subtle, like essentially like electrical glowing, um, meridian lines that they followed for navigation. Really? I'll have to look this up. Yeah. There was an article that I read and, you know, in my adult brain, I can't remember all the specifics <laughs> of it, but it was in the grail. I think that's because we've read too much. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I, I'm going to go look for that though. That's awesome. And yeah, I, if you go to the daily grail, it should be there. So I, I'm a huge fan of Thor Heyerdahl too. And I have that's never actually name. read. Yeah. Yeah. Thor Heyerdahl. I mean that if there was a name for a modern explorer, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, the the guy sounds like a, an Indiana Jones superhero adventurer. Here it is, Polynesian. I'm sorry, it's called Telapa, the flashing, and okay. it was a, a navigation method, uh, water lightning, and it was you know it was an RPG, but it was Greg who did it, um, uh, and it was talking about how if, uh, so in the uh, Tuamato Archipelago in Polynesia, um, Apparently, to calculate, and this is uh, uh, coming from a recent article uh, at the conversation. This is recent in, um, uh, you know, this is you know from maybe last year, uh, talking about how to calculate their position on Earth. Voyagers memorize star maps, and let's see, um, trying to find the uh, uh, the right part. Uh, so um, here is it. Uh, the Polynesian Itelapa is usually only done within 120 miles from shore, I guess. But there are these oceanic lights that they would apparently use to, uh, they're like straight lines. And according to uh, the people that were there under this particular sailor's tutelage, they were able to observe this, um, uh, these lightning like straight bolts. That would happen for a fraction of a second. This has happened in 1998, and the uh, the sailor uh, Cavia said that the islands, basically, it's the islands. They say these sailors, the Polynesian sailors, the islands are sending these bolts of uh, light, like uh, light, out in between each other, and that's how they're navigating between all of the Polynesian islands. Huh. That's yeah. like they're connected electrically or something. That's right. interesting. And I can just picture that like yeah. pulsing between. Yeah. So it's know. spelled Telapa, T E space L A P A. Wow. Okay. I would never heard of that. It's pretty cool. I think we find electricity everywhere if we look hard enough. Yeah, if only where there was right. some sort of universal theory about electricity. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, so he continues Good UFOs have anything to do with disappearing people. It would seem that whenever the phenomena of UFOs. Whatever the phenomena of the UFO really is, it might indeed have something to do with disappearing people. And so Mm -hmm. could time warps and holes in space and distortions of this plane that we consider reality. 
Yeah. For example, at sundown on February 12, 1953, witnesses told police that they had watched an automobile enter the throat of a storm drain near Willowbrook and Greenleaf Avenues in Los Angeles. Officers arrived on the scene within 10 minutes, and according to the Los Angeles Herald and Express, they followed the fresh, fresh tire tread marks into the tunnel for seven miles. Other policemen and flood control district workers continued the search for the automobile by dropping through manhole covers. The track down continued until midnight when seven miles up the storm drain, the tracks vanished. Herald and Express newsmen who had accompanied the police on the incredible search up the tube were witnesses to the fact that in the muddy silt covering the floor of the drain, the tire marks were sharp and fresh. Then no more tracks. Obviously a super... Yeah, superheroes' uh, uh, secret lair is there. <laughs> oh, there you go. That's where the Batmobile goes. <laughs> the secret panel <laughs> slides away. Too. <laughs> That's <laughs> wild. I love it. I was thinking <laughs> Storm Drain initially, like small the little one yeah small yeah. one and i was like well that's fantastic <laughs> well that's some high strangeness there but the, the even so out. in like a in a you know a, a storm drain that would accommodate a car that's pretty i i really like that story that's really interesting yeah I, it must be big but I, I know when i was a kid there was uh, a drain that kind of ran underneath um some stuff in my town that my friends and i would go and like walk down yeah but, yeah it's that's crazy to think of bringing a vehicle into one of those Oh, hmm. if, it's, if it's big enough, but, you know, like, where did it go? Yeah. Right. Right. It's a you car. Know, it's not like you could just lift it out of there. Yeah, exactly. Right. You know, so that actually makes me think back to us talking about time storms before we we uh, went on the air. Uh, you know, it, it, and I, I'm making a lot of stretches here, but, uh, you know, if you're in the right conditions, you've probably got a lot of interesting rebar making almost like a Faraday cage around the uh, – Mm. <laughs> the uh, uh, storm drain. And then, you know, what happens to people that end up in these time slips, but they don't come back? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, or maybe that was them coming over to this side for just a little bit. Mm. Right. Right. Um, he well, and it, it, it may be a stretch, but uh, you know, there's <laughs> maybe the possibility of uh, very carefully reversing all the way through. Um, yeah, but it sounds like you know, the police followed perfectly. right behind, you know, because people saw it go in. Oh, okay. <laughs> but yeah, there's no way you could possibly reverse right back on your own fire, tire tracks no. without it being noticeable <laughs> to somebody. Yep. Um, some he it says, would take some skill. <laughs> what was that? Oh, I said it would take some skill. Just a bit. Uh, is it really possible for an automobile to disappear without a trace? All that can be stated dogmatically in the case cited above is that it would have been impossible for the car to have gotten out of the tunnel in any way other than the one, the way it used to enter the control drain, at least in any way that our normal contemporary science knows or lists in the accredited laws. Uh, according to a United Press International news story date, dated uh, Datelined London, England, Seven trucks, along with their drivers, totally and inexplicably vanished during a four-month period in 1958. Somehow, the authorities said, the seven men and their vehicles disappeared shortly after leaving the parking lot of a popular highway cafe. Trucking firm executives testified that each of the men were reliable employees and that each of the drivers were bachelors. Could some love-struck flying saucer females have decided to go fishing above that British highway? <laughs> or worse... Could some entities in a, on a cosmic safari have bagged some fresh mountings for their trophy rooms or trapped some new specimens for their zoos? On the other hand, perhaps some unusually talented men and women or some unusually talented alien visitors in our midst might be able to vanish quite deliberately and at will. Mm. In the October 1953 issue of Fate, uh, Miss B.E. Weber of Glendale, California, wrote to the editors to tell them of a remarkable experience which she had undergone some years before. According to Mrs. Weber, she had left the home of a friend on the east side of the city around midnight. As she neared the intersection close to her home, she saw a tall man with what appeared to be a chiffon mantle over his head. A chiffon mantle? I, I don't know. Chiffon mantle? Yeah, okay. What is it? Uh, I mean, chiffon is like a sort of uh, um, uh, uh, um, puffy fabric, I think. Huh, okay. What appeared to be a chiffon mantle over his head walked by on a cross street. The man walked very fast, and Mrs. Weber remembers thinking to herself that the man appeared strange and peculiar. 
As the man stepped off the curb to cross the street, Mrs. Weber writes, he dissolved into the air and disappeared. I came to the spot in about two minutes, but there was no one in sight. I saw no cars parked near the spot and heard no sounds. The disappearance took place under a bright street light at the intersection. A mantle is a uh, uh, like an old style like cape cloak. Oh. So a chiffon mantle okay. would be sort of like a, an, an anachronistic kind of, uh, I don't know, maybe gothic type look. I could see that. I, I looked it up and a lot of what I'm seeing is like, um, I mean, they're almost like... Uh, like a dress, but like it's a cape. It's it's yeah. totally open in the front and wraps around the the sleeves and goes down to the ankles. I'm starting to think this is all Batman, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, know, you never know. <laughs> First, Actually, it was the Batmobile. Those other guys were bad guys, <laughs> and Batman made him disappear. <laughs> Actually, I have I have a question. Uh, since yeah. since you guys seem to know more decent amount about comics. I'm I'm currently watching the new Batman movie, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, I'm, and I'm I haven't seen it yet, but yeah. Well, I'm curious: is the current sort of realistic style more in tune with the comic books, or was it more like the campy TV series of the '60s? There have been so. I mean, at least in my experience of Batman, there have been so many iterations of him throughout the years. Um, there certainly have been, you know, some like realistic quote unquote Batmans, but. The thing about Batman is Batman is usually like placed within the context of the greater DC universe. And so that's been the thing that, you know, beyond Zack Snyder's, um, you know, foray into that, uh, all of these like one off Batman films that don't really have any other like superheroes he's dealing with. That usually ends up making it a lot more sort of quote unquote realistic mm, because yeah. there's not like. Because DC has some crazy superheroes, you know? Right, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, uh, to Chris's point, even from the same creator, you can have one story that's very, like, you know, crime noir, very, very down to earth. And then sure. another story might be, like, there, there's UFOs in Gotham City. Sure, you know? yeah. yeah. Grant Morrison uh, did, like, you know, he did this, you know, uh, sort of seminal uh, graphic novel called... Uh, um, Arkham Asylum that was sort of, you know, and it was drawn by Dave McKean and it was this like almost horror, like saw before saw really like darks, uh, um, uh, creepy, uh, you know, magical sort of, uh, um, take on Batman. And then, you know, more recently he did like Batman and son incorporated where it's like Batman and his son who is Robin, like have a corporation that fights crime. Totally oh. different tone. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and it kidding. definitely that Batman and son draws on the, you know, sixties and seventies camp. There was a, yep. a league of Batman around the world in the sixties. Yep. And so, um, but this movie, uh, draws a lot off of the long Halloween, which is very much a detective story. Yeah. And then okay. the tone to me, it seems very much lifted from, Frank Miller's Batman year one, yeah. um, which is also a very grounded, you know, take on the character. Very and from what everything I've seen, they've basically made the Riddler into Zodiac. Yeah. It, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. He, he's like Zodiac with, well, I want to be careful what I say, right. uh, because I don't want to spoil it for anybody. Right. But, uh, right. Yeah, they, so, they, they find a way to make him Bruce relatable as Zodiac. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I, I also have yeah. not seen this uh, this new movie, um, but yeah, I guess in my experience with Batman, you know, comics or graphic novels, the stuff I've read has tended to be a little more on the like grittier side. I guess okay. um, I wouldn't necessarily say down to earth because it's definitely still very comic-y, especially yeah. with all the different characters. But it was certainly a lot more violent and like intense than I was like. Uh, expecting having seen like some movies, right, mm-hmm. right, mm-hmm. Um, which I you know I like personally, but um, I, I, it does I, seem that they're very all over the place. I, I am enjoying this one, however, it's taking me a really long time to watch it because it's three hours long, and I watch <laughs> things in like ten to twenty yeah, right. minute bursts. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, sure. And I'm like, because I put it on, I'm like, oh god, it's three hours. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well. <laughs> yeah. What I enjoy about it is, uh, you know, it's it's very, um, you know, kind of seven esque in a way, but yeah, 
you know, the way Batman's presented at times is very much like playing all the old horror movie tropes where like Michael Byers is just slowly, you know, striding towards you. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. um, mm-hmm. Things like that. Uh, yeah. When the Batmobile is introduced, I don't know if you've gotten to that yet, yes. but yeah. That is like a demon has risen from the earth <laughs> and yeah. it's possessed. Uh, like, talk about a way to introduce a character. And I'm calling the Batmobile a character. Um, yeah. It's just, those are things that, like, mixing that in with the very, like, grounded tone of the film just make them even creepier, I think. Yeah. All right. Let's jump back into the book here. Uh, <laughs> chapter three of the book is called Lost in Time and Space. Uh, which kind of taps into that time storms thing we were talking about. Uh, Mm. About 7.30 a.m. on Sunday, August 25th, 1968, Church Secretary Dixie Lee Arneson left her home for the non-denominational Hillcrest Church in order to prepare the bulletin for the morning services. Her husband, Jonathan, was the associated associate youth minister at the church, and he was still preparing for his duties, which were to begin at 9 a.m., He said goodbye to his wife outside the house and then went back in to shave, dress, and do some last-minute work. Since it's only a five-minute drive from the Arsacen home to the Hillcrest Church, it seems reasonable to assume that Dixie Lee arrived there about 7.45 a.m. She let herself in with her own key, unlocked her office door, and then took out a sheet of stenciled paper and turned on the IBM electric typewriter. As the typewriter hummed into readiness, she removed a handwritten sheet with information for a bulletin from her purse, placed it on the desk beside her. She sat back comfortably in her chair and began to type. At 9.15 a.m., Jonathan Arnson, so it's A-R-E-N-S-E-N, Arensen, arrived, yeah, something, I don't know, Arensen, maybe, arrived at the church. He walked to the office to greet his wife. He could hear the electric typewriter humming, but when he opened the door to his office, he was startled to find his wife was not at her desk. It was not like her to leave a machine running and unattended. The puzzled husband began to look for his wife in the church proper and then extended his search to the church grounds. No Dixie Lee. Then it occurred to him that she might have become ill. That might explain the typewriter left running. He ran to the restroom, confident he had solved the mystery, and when he found the room empty, he was beginning to feel alarmed. Dixie Lee's car stood at the curb on the side street leading to the church door that she had unlocked. Why would she have suddenly decided to walk home, especially when she could go, especially when he was at home and could have brought anything she had forgotten if she would have given him a call on the telephone? By now it was 9.30 a.m. and children were arriving for Sunday school. The youth minister felt torn between his duty to the children and his concern for his wife. The church's pastor had resigned that July, and the minister that morning was merely visiting the church on a trial basis. The teachers and restless pupils were looking to the youth minister for direction, but he was consumed by anxiety, which I think is understandable. (laughs) Then a 12-year-old girl named uh, handed Jonathan Arneson his wife's glasses. Dixie Lee was terribly nearsighted. She even wore her glasses to go to the washroom. She could scarcely see a thing without them, and Dixie only had one pair. Where the girl found the glasses, well, she was not certain. She thought she had picked them up from Mrs. Arneson's desk, but maybe she had found them on the floor next to the desk. She couldn't remember. But she thought she should give them to Mr. Arneson right away. For the first time, Jonathan Arneson yielded to fear. His wife would not have gone anywhere without her glasses. At 2 p.m., he called the police which still seems like a long time from the point where he noticed yeah. her missing. Uh, a missing person report was sent out on Dixie Lee Arneson, and a search was instituted that became virtually worldwide in its radius. Since her parents were missionaries, Dixie has spent many years abroad. Dixie Lee's expired passport was discovered among her things at home, however, and it became clear that the 20-year-old bride had not developed a sudden and unexplainable yen to revisit her old homes around the globe. On September 1st, Dr. Harry Schaefer, Dixie Lee's father, left his mission in Kenya, Africa to fly to Granada Hills in order to offer what comfort and aid he might provide to the sorrowing young husband and the investigating authorities. In October, Mrs. Schaefer decided not to battle anxiety alone back in Kenya, and she too came to California. The police investigation led them to proceed on the assumption that the 12-year-old girl that found Mr. Mrs. Arison's glasses on the carpet, and that their position on the floor was suggestive of foul play. According to their reasoning, the fact that the glasses were lying on the floor offered a strong indication that the glasses had been knocked from the young woman's face. 
But of course, it was not a demonstrable fact that the glasses were indeed found on the carpet. The young student had become confused by the excitement her innocent discovery had precipitated, and she was uncertain whether or not she had discovered them on the carpet or the desk. Dr. Schaefer was quoted as saying, Dixie is a gifted, sensitive, lively girl who would not have imposed this situation on her family and friends if she could help it. The Los Angeles Police Department's missing person report on Dixie Arneson comments, foul play feared due to circumstances of subjects leaving, nothing in subjects background would indicate a sudden departure. I've stopped making guesses, said her husband, Jonathan. I just don't know what to think. Did Dixie Lee Arneson somehow meet with foul play as she sat at her typewriter in the office of Hillcrest Christian Church, or did she meet with a fate far beyond our contemporary science's ability to deduce? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it sounds like probably foul play, I guess. That's that's my first inclination. Um, or like a fugue state, maybe. Something, you know, something where she just, I don't know, got disoriented and, you know, her glasses got knocked off during that. But you would, walked away. I, w- I would think you'd find more evidence of foul play of just than just her glasses being knocked off. Yeah, yeah like a break in or or things knocked over on the desk. Yeah, or it's it's weird that like the typewriter is still on. That's yeah. an interesting detail, which implies she got there. She sat down. She was about to start typing, and then whatever happened happened. And then, and then she was whisked away into fairyland. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I always wonder uh, on the foul play side of things, if like, you know, the person got lured away, uh, you know, maybe to like in this case outside or something like that. So the struggle happened out front where it would be harder to track because there's sure. you know, asphalt and concrete and things and, you know, pulled in the car. Maybe her glasses fell off there. They locked her in the car, then ran the glasses back inside. So you would keep any kind of connection to, where the, uh, you know, uh, kidnapping took place, uh, uh, harder to find, if that makes sense. Would, wouldn't you just take the glasses with you though? Uh, that's a good point. Yeah. So I, yeah. I just, uh, Googled her and the first thing that comes up is her entry in the Charlie project and she has never been found. Wow. She would be 74 at this point. Huh. Uh, it says Aronson's father theorized that somebody followed her to the church office and attacked her there. No suspects have ever been named in her disappearance, and her case remains unsolved. Interesting. So, I mean, yeah, that's that's a hard one. I mean, yeah, it could have been foul play. We can't say it's not. We can't say it's paranormal because we there's just no info there. Right. It's just a weird disappearance. Yeah. And she was small, too. Uh, she was 5'6 uh, and 135 pounds. Oh, yeah, she was tiny. So, but... Uh, yeah, it doesn't. There's no new information here. So his, you know, his book in 1972 has the same information as the Charlie Project today. Oh wow! So that's that's bizarre. And that was 1968 that yeah. she went missing. I think so. That's crazy. I'd have to go back a page here. Uh, yeah, 1960, that's what I'm seeing online. 1968. Yeah. Um, he then continues. Uh, on Sunday morning, August August 6, 1956, 13 year old Donald Lee ba- Donald Lee Baker of Rockvale, Arizona, Azusa, California, set off on a bicycle ride with his new friend, 11-year-old Brenda Howell, who was visiting a married sister. The ride was to be a brief one for Helen Baker. Donald's mother had instructed him to be home by 8.30 a.m., so he might accompany her to church services. I wonder if this is the one from the back. Yes, it is. I think it is, yeah. Yes, this is a more detailed account of this one. Um, When the children had not returned by evening, Mrs. Baker and her husband, Jesse, a chemical plant foreman, picked up Brenda Howell's sister, Mrs. Mary Edwards, and the three of them notified the police. Officers soon located Brenda's bicycle and Donald's jacket in the brush near the reservoir at the edge of the Angeles National Forest. Navy divers were commissioned to search the mile-long, 60-foot deep body of water while police officers, sheriff's deputies, and hundreds of volunteers began to carefully scour the area. No trace of the two children has ever been found. On March 23, 1957, eight-year-old Tommy Bowman stepped around a corner in the forest trail just ahead of six members of his family and vanished without a trace. This particular forest trail happened to be in the same Devil's Gate Reservoir uh, area as above the city of Atadina, not far from Azusa in California's Angeles National Forest, where Donald Lee Baker and Brenda Howe had disappeared on August 6, 1956. 
Although it may seem unbelievable that a human being could simply walk around a corner and disappear, Tommy Bowman's father, sister, brother, uncle, and two cousins insisted through their horror and shock that that is exactly what happened. Within hours after the distraught Bowman family had notified the authorities of Tommy's disappearance, the area was being searched by over 400 volunteers, trained rescue do dogs, mounted patrols, and bush beaters. Woodsmen thoroughly examined any crevices into which a child might have fallen or crawled. The forest trail on which Tommy was last seen was crossed and recrossed by dozens of keen-eyed outdoorsmen. The extensive search was supplemented by low-flying helicopters that crisscrossed the entire area again and again. To men knowledgeable in all ways of wood lore, it was quickly and easily determined that the eight-year-old had not slipped off the trail. No dislodged rocks, torn away shrubs, or broken branches betrayed such an accident at a spot where Tommy had last been seen. And it must be remembered that the boy's family had been but a few steps behind him, and they surely would have heard Tommy cry out had he tripped and fallen off the forest path. Even if the boy had not screamed out in fear, uh, if he had missed his footing, the family would have been close enough behind him to have seen and to have heard him fall. The volunteers and the professionals searched for little Tommy Bowman for a week, but it appeared that the boy had literally been plucked from the earth by some unseen and unknown force. Mm -hmm. Wow. So let's let's look up Tommy Bowman. See if there's anything new here. <laughs> Is that B O W or B O U H G H? Yeah. Okay. Tommy, it's one of the things that comes up. Tommy Bowen, Bowman missing again. Charlie Project. Charlie Project. Yeah. Um, uh, they have an age group progression picture. Uh, Thomas's case was reopened in 2007 as authorities renewed the search for the bodies of Edwards' victims. Um, authorities believe Ray Mac Edwards was responsible for Thomas's disappearance. In 1970, oh, Edwards pleaded guilty to three California killing three California children and sentenced to death at his own request. He, he confessed to killing Brenda Howell, Donald Baker, and Roger Madison as well. And authorities believe he was also most likely responsible for the disappearances of Bruce, Bruce Kremen, Ramona Price, and Karen Tompkins. Uh, Edwards lead, led authorities to a site where he said he had buried some of his victims, but no evidence was located. He died by suicide on death row in 1971 a photograph of edwards is posted with this case summary his alleged victims range in age from 7 to 16 years old thomas's case was reopened in 2007 as authorities renewed the search for the bodies of edwards victims he was employed as a heavy uh, equipment operator in the 1950s and 60s and helped construct many highways across the state of california investigators believe he may have buried the child's remains under the highways oh interesting I mean, it's creepy and messed up to just, I mean, if somebody was actually to do that to, you know, I mean, kids or anybody, but especially to never find the bodies is even weirder. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if they're under the highway. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's you're not going to find them. Yeah. That's, uh, that's one of those things that it's just makes it extra disturbing. Right. Because right. yeah, they, they, they would not be found. So this one, uh, and the Charlie Project here, I skipped to the end. Uh, it says, Thomas was last seen walking with his cousins and other family members on a trail, which is what we got from that. Uh, he told his relatives he was running ahead to the car, and when his loved ones got there later, he was not there, which is very different from what uh, Steiger says in the book, which is that they were right behind him. An extensive mm -hmm. search produced no clues as to his whereabouts. A week after Thomas disappeared, a letter was mailed to his home, which stated he was alive and well and being cared for by an unidentified man. Another letter sent to a newspaper stated that Thomas was living in Oklahoma. It is unknown whether either communication was authentic. Neither one led to Thomas's whereabouts. Yeah, like, you know, I mean, if it was like a kidnapper or murderer or something, that's terrible. But it could also have been somebody you know, exploiting the situation. Oh, yeah. A, a, yeah. a week later, surely that sure. was public at that point, I would assume. Yeah, you would think. It was probably national yeah, news. Yeah, and, and occasionally you hear about things like that where, you know, like the, three children disappear from this place and later on there's a letter that's supposedly from one of them that says they're doing fine or something like that. Uh, but, you know, usually when those get followed up on, nothing comes of them. So, yeah, I, right. that, that's interesting to me. And I also wonder if there's, a, a you know, either exploiting the situation or are – it's people that aren't connected to the disappearance, but they, you know, it, it, it's almost 
the pain is uh, sort of a fetish for them, I guess, or something like that. Yeah, it's like a Munchausen's by proxy. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so this next one, uh, Bruce Kremen, also the same guy, uh, Mac Ray Edwards, confessed to his murder. The question okay. is, how is he grabbing these people without anyone noticing? Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, some of these places are... are have been staked out so well, unfortunately, like I've, I've heard of people talking about, you know, uh, my boyfriend and I were hiking and I looked back and I saw, you know, a guy standing behind a rock watching us and, uh, yelled at my boyfriend. And when we turned back and look around, the person was gone. Um, it's easy so, to hide in the woods. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's easy to hide in the woods. And so if you were a serial killer, like, yeah, that's probably a good place for you to go find people, unfortunately, to find victims. Yeah. Um, so this next one is not of the same serial killer. Um, October 4th, 1940, Mr. and Mrs. Earl Kirk disappeared along with their car and everything in it somewhere on the highway between Sudbury and Salt St. Marie, Ontario. Kirk, a successful businessman in North Bay, Ontario, had his business affairs in order and his bank account solidly intact. He and his wife, Dolly, were very close to one another and both devoted to the four children whom they had left at home. A friend and business associate in Sudbury had asked the Kirks to spend the night, but they had declined his invitation and explained that they wished to make make Salt St. Marie before calling it a day. The last person known to have seen Earl and Dolly Kirk was an operator at a gas station in Sudbury. He remembered pointing out to them the street that led to westbound Highway 17. More than 100 men worked for six weeks, dragging rivers and lakes along the highway, searching the bush before coming, before the coming snows and freezing weather forced them to abandon the investigation. Absolutely no clue has ever been found to indicate what happened to the Kirks or their automobile. So I, I pulled this one up. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so it looks like they found and, the car. So in 19- Well, they did find the car. So, in, so yeah, according to this, what am I on? SoToday.com. Um, oh, yep. Okay. That's what I'm looking at, too. In 1947, the Kirks were legally declared to be deceased, despite their car and their bodies never being found. Their children, one of whom was only a baby when it, when they vanished, would receive a share of their estate when they became adults. The Kirks' disappearance so completely baffled police that it became somewhat of a legend. The media, as well, found themselves plagued by the question of what happened to the Kirks until the car turned up at the bottom of St. Mary's River. Needless to say, there was considerable attention and curiosity over the discovery of the car. The vehicle was mud-covered, and it was impossible for divers to get a clear look at anything that would identify identify the car. However, as they hauled the car out of the river, the first glimpse was the license plate, and uh, that confirmed it was the Kirk's car. Once the water had been poured out and the vehicle had been inched onto dry ground, police cleared the spectators from the area and opened the door. Inside were the remains of a man and a woman. Their identification papers and personal possessions of various states of decomposition further com- mm-hmm. confirmed their identity. The ignition was still on and the car was still placed in reverse a decade and a half after they went missing. Police were finally able to piece together what happened to the Kirks. On their way to Michigan, they had likely mistaken the CPR dock for the ferry dock tried to turn around, Mitch judged where they were in relation to the river, and backed off the dock into the water. News of the discovery traveled fast and far. In Saskatchewan, Mm -hmm. the youngest Kirk daughter found out that her parents' bodies via radio broadcast. She was sitting and listening with her aunt, who stepped in to raise her after the disappearance. When the initial shock wore off, the aunt described feeling vindicated. I've always felt they must have driven into a river or something, she told reporters. (laughs) The day day Mm -hmm. after... Police found the Kirk's vehicle. They located a second car in the river. Drivers confirmed that this car did belong to Arthur Rooley, the missing man. His body was recovered later that day. So I guess that starts with Arthur and then ends yeah. It's a very long article here. So the article says, um, uh, oh gosh, where'd it go? Basically, it was uh, how looking for this, I think this other guy, Arthur Rooley, ended up leading to finding um, yeah. Earl and Dolly kirk uh by the way the just a random fun fact for you that town is uh is actually called sue saint marie um oh. i'm not 100 percent sure why but i only know that because uh, a friend of mine was going to move there at one point no. interesting but yeah okay i mean that sounds like uh you know that's a it makes total sense you know it's such yeah. a mundane explanation you know for something that could have been you know we 
it could have been we could have inferred Betty and Barney Hill too, you know. But no, they just back backed off a a dock. I've done what? dumb stuff like that, you know, not backed off a dock, but you know, <laughs> it's one of my biggest fears. Yeah, I mean, driving. I, I uh, living where I live, you know, in Minnesota. There's a lot of lakes, and um, around my my folks' place, it's just like like thin roads uh, snaking between islands and rake or and lakes. Right. Mm. And there's not a whole lot in terms of like railways at all. So yeah. it's like at you know at night in the dark or you know in the winter everything's covered in ice. Yep. I'm you know terrified like you know going in <laughs> into the drink. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, hmm. Okay. So this one is uh, Thomas P. Meehan. Uh, okay. So I'll read it from the book. The Strange Disappearance of Thomas P. Meehan, a 38-year-old Concord, California attorney and referee for the State Department of Employment Appeals Bureau on February 1st, 1963, would seem to suggest that a bizarre kind of distortion of time occurred in some mysterious manner. Oh, yes, I do remember this one. Meehan left Eureka for Concord at about 2 p.m. He drove as far as Myers Flat before he stopped to telephone his wife and complained that he felt ill. She told him to spend the night at a motel and not to try to drive through. It is from this point that the time sequence becomes most confusing, all the more so when the startling climax of the day's events is realized. Approximately 5 p.m., Meehan checked into the 40 Winks Motel at Redway. Approximately 6 p.m., the attorney drove to the Southern Humboldt Community Hospital at Garberville to see a doctor. At 6.45, Meehan told the nurse that he felt as if he were dead. While she was checking him and before he had seen a doctor, Meehan disappeared. At 7 p.m., a Myers flat couple told the highway patrol that they had seen the taillights of a car on Highway 101 drive into the Eel River. At 8 p.m., attorney Meehan was talking with Chip Nunemaker, the owner of the 40 Winks, at the motel, Meehan asked the innkeeper, do I look like I'm dead? I feel like I've died and the whole world died with me. Nunamaker noticed that Meehan's shoes and trouser cuffs appeared wet and muddy. 9 p.m., Meehan went to his room. 9.30, motel employee Harry Young went to Meehan's room to tell him that the call he had put through to Mrs. Meehan would not be completed because a storm had disrupted telephone service. Young saw that Meehan had changed into a black suit and a white shirt. 10.45, 10.45, the highway patrol around Meehan's car, um, hang on here, I want to make sure I'm not skipping a page, the highway patrol found Meehan's car submerged in the Eel River, its taillights still shining like beacons for the searchers. Skid marks indicated that the vehicle had gone off the highway at high speed. Officers found blood on top of the car, the right front window of the car was open, Meehan was nowhere in sight, but droplets of blood and muddy footprints lit- led the up the bank for 30 feet and then vanished. No trace of Thomas Meehan was found. Then, 19 days later, his body was discovered in the Eel River near Myers Flat, 16 miles downstream from where Meehan's car had veered into the river. The evidence of the autopsy suggested that the attorney had survived the crash with a superficial head wound and then later died of drowning. Did Thomas Meehan's illness and confused state of mind lead him to weave in and out of hospitals and motel rooms and into a cold and swirling river? Or did that same confused but powerful mind exert an influence upon time and space? If Meehan's automobile went into the river at 7, and it must have since no other automobiles were reported missing or were ever found in the river on that date, then how did he appear back at the motel to chat for an hour from 8 to 9 with the owner? Chip Mm -hmm. Nunemaker did take note of Meehan's muddy shoes and trouser cuffs and the attorney's repeated complaint that he felt as if he was dead. Employee Harry Young saw Meehan at 9.30 and observed that Meehan had changed out of his wet clothing. Had Nunemaker and, and Young actually talked with a dead man? Although Meehan did not disappear without a trace forever, he certainly did disappear and reappear all during the evening of February 1st. And after he was last seen by Harry Young in his motel room, Meehan's body was not found until February 20th. Meehan's car was seen to plunge into Eel River at about the same time he was sitting in the hospital at Gerberville waiting to see a doctor. The police found drops of blood and muddy footprints that led up the bank for 30 feet before they simply vanished. Could Meehan had made his way back to Forty Winks Motel? Or did Thomas Meehan actually die by drowning when his automobile went into the river at 7 p.m.? 
Could his ill and confused mind and the will to live have projected an image of himself to the nurse, to Nuna Maker, to Young, while his actual physical shell floated lifeless in the Eel River? I, I've never heard of anybody saying that they felt like they were dead and like well, complaining. That sounds to me like Qatar's delusion. Yes. Has anybody heard of that? I have. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and you probably know about it because of uh, the guy from Mayhem and Morbid, right? No. Yeah. So the uh, you know the the bands. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, the the singer, what was his name? Uh, Dead, wasn't it? Uh, I think so, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he had, and I only remember this just because I was interested in Qatar's delusion for a while. Like, he, he actually had Qatar's delusion, and I think he talked about it in his suicide note. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, per so, Olin, oh, per Olin, dead. Mm, Interesting. Maybe. Yeah. So I would be curious... Did, did it tell us what he was wearing when they found the body? No. Okay. Um, I'm, looking, I'm, looking at, I'm looking at a current article on it. Um, Thomas Mian was killed when he was thrown from his car and banged his head. At 7 p.m., his car was witnessed to have plunged into the river, but at 6.50, he was in the hospital. He yeah, had to that's... fill out paperwork that probably took more than 10 minutes. He then disappeared. How does that work? Uh, right. He kept asking everyone if he looked dead. He also appeared wet and had mud on him. Um, he was seen in the hotel room. Uh, he was staying at at 8 p.m. and 9 p.m. That is after his car went into the river. Uh, I believe the witnesses to the accident were off about the time of the car going into the river. I think Thomas was dead and he showed up at the hospital at 6.30. No, he wasn't a walking dead body. He was a fully formed apparition. That's where they're going with this. Hmm. Full torso apparition. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. I'm just looking to see if there's another. No, that's not it. So what Qatar's delusion is, in case anybody's oh, yes. not familiar with it, just just to explain it really briefly, it's basically like uh, you believe you're dead. Um, it's a a um, a particular type of you know psychiatric delusion. I think they it, it might be associated with certain like lesions in the brain, but it's something that was sort of discovered and, you know, given a name, uh, uh, I, you know, more than a hundred years ago, I think. Um, but there have been, you know, certain, uh, sort of famous cases of it, um, that have, you know, within psychology that have popped up. And I remember even, you know, I think there were a couple of, uh, I remember an episode of some show, uh, gosh, what was it? It was, uh, the TV version, TV show Hannibal did a show on it, uh, okay. where they had somebody that was, you know, believed they had uh believe they were dead and it does so you you but like the the guy you know from um uh mayhem you know he i think it happened because he had some sort of uh, uh traumatic experience when he was younger and died for a certain amount of time but okay. it oftentimes happens to people who have had brain injuries like you know so motorcycle accident or something like that and uh yeah you 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 believe you're dead your you know your body is rotting it's it's you know there's a movie um where this coroner has this girl convinced she's dead mm. uh mm. It's, it's a girl who's in a lot of horror movies and i cannot remember the name of the movie or her name um but literally he has her on a slab and everything and he has her absolutely oh. convinced she's dead yeah is it uh what's her name she was in all those lucky mckee movies I think I know who you're talk what you're talking I can't about. Remember, yeah. I can't remember enough to even look it up. Mm. Huh. Real so, quick, the um, Qatar delusion, of, I guess, is also called the delirium of negation, <laughs> and I'm seeing it does not appear. Yeah, it's it's not mentioned in either the DSM or the uh, 10th edition of the International Statistic Classification of Diseases and Related Health Problems mm -hmm. um, Interesting. manuals. Yeah. Okay, so maybe it's not as legitimate, but well, well no, it, I mean, it looks like it is. It's a, <laughs> not that the DSM is the end all be all, uh, right? By any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of information about it, and there's there's all kinds of stuff here. Um, yeah. Granted, I'm on Wikipedia, but yeah, it, it just points out that it's it's not mentioned in either of these books. Interesting. Well, it you know I I wonder about the superficial head injury. Um, yeah. You know, and if we looked at it now, would we think it as superficial as, you know, the time that uh, yeah. he was examined in autopsy? Right. Um, that's why I'm very curious about, like, what he had on right. when they found his body. Because yeah, that, exactly. that would really tell you, like, okay, he had time to go back and change clothes and then came back, you know. Uh, maybe he but thought they, he was going to go back and get his car out of the water or something like that. Who knows? Okay. 
Yeah, I was going to say, they found him in the river. So, like, he would have to return to the uh, uh, yeah. scene of the crime. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If he's already in a, a weird state, like, oh, gosh, I need to go yeah. check on that. You know, I mean, who knows? And I guess if you shift things, if you say, okay, maybe everyone wasn't quite right about the times, you know, maybe he did have enough time to get from the hospital to the river. Yeah. Uh, it's But it's, there's no way to know. Right. Also, that movie is called Afterlife with a period between after and life. And it's uh, Christina Ricci. Oh, Christina Ricci. Okay. 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 After I a car accident. S- after a car accident. I'm thinking y- of a different, uh, different movie. After a car accident, a young woman caught between life and death meets a funeral director who claims to have the gift of transitioning the dead into the afterlife. Interesting. Hmm. I could see, you know, on top of like a ghost or actually being walk- walking around or something, I could see it having been that this guy was, you know, walking around, living his life, and some kind of weird time shift happened where, you know, his his sort of body became, um, you know, uh, preoccupied or, or taken over by the state of his body after he died. Yeah. You know, mm. or something like that. I don't know, just, mm-hmm. just something I thought of. It, it definitely seems like time is kind of Swiss cheese there a little bit. Yeah. And so when I was looking him up, I came up with the mysterious disappearance of Patricia Meehan. And this okay. one says, in 1989, this is off of uh, Urbo.com, in 1989, April 1989, a single car accident sparked a decades-long search for a missing Montana woman. She still hasn't been found, but she's somehow been reported and seen thousands of times. Getting into a car accident is undoubtedly one of everyone's worst fears. It's a fear that becomes amplified at night. The darkness ends at an adds an unsettling element okay let's let's go down here the accident on night of april 20th 1989 a woman named peggy bueller was driving down a montana highway 200 in circle montana with her father during the trip at approximately 8 15 they noticed a car driving on the wrong side of the road and it was headed straight towards them they managed to swerve out of the way in time but the car behind them wasn't so lucky the car crashed into that of carol hines a police dispatcher who happened to be off duty at the time Alive and completely unharmed, Hines emerged from her car and as she surveyed the scene before her, saw a blonde woman get out of the car that hit her. The woman walked walked right up to her and while she didn't say a word, Hines said the woman gave her a look that felt as if she was staring right through her. She walked away and made her way over to a nearby fence. Bueller says she later saw the woman look at the scene as if she hadn't been involved in any of it at all. As I looked out across the accident, I noticed someone from the other side of the fence standing there like a spectator, not like it had happened to her, she said. Eventually, the woman walked away into the field and completely vanished into the night. Prior to her bizarre disappearance, Meehan lived a fairly normal life in Bozeman, Montana. Though she had previously studied early, ch- though she had previously studied early childhood development, she had abandoned that pursuit at some time to become a ranch hand. Her love of animals being the reason behind the switch. She also worked a few odd jobs in addition to working on the ranch just to bring in whatever extra money she could to support herself. Before the accident, the last person to see her was her landlord. He noted that she wasn't quite acting like herself and seemed almost hyper. He's not the only one that noticed unusual behavior from her either. Her mother noted that sometime prior to her daughter's disappearance, she had seemed increasingly depressed, quiet, and detached. She was, I guess, taking in her own life. What she had accomplished, her mother, Dolly Mann, said, I think she missed having children because she realized she really loved them. Not much is known about Mian's life directly before the accident, but some theorize she may have been trying to take her own life by driving on the wrong side of the road. Uh, her family later found Mian's camera with a roll of undeveloped film in it. Once processed, they saw Mian had been taking a rather chilling self-portrait in a mirror. It was a photo that solidified for them just how troubled Mian may have been at the time. That same night, uh, within a half an hour after the accident, authorities had determined the 37-year-old Mian was, an, was the unidentified blonde driver who was involved in the accident. They began to search the area near the scene and eventually discovered a trail of shoe prints that led through the field approximately 0.75 miles away from the scene of the crash. It believed the tracks belonged to Meehan. The investigators on scene followed the trail of prints until about 3 a.m. when the tracks eventually faded away due to the terrain of the area. Well, at least they didn't just stop. Uh, It was then that they decided to put a hold on their search until the next day. Shortly after they were alerted of Meehan's disappearance, her family made their way to the Montana to ass- to the Montana to Montana to assist with the search. Volunteers used ATVs and horses to trek through the terrain, nearby mountains, and even some abandoned coal mines in the area, looking for any sign of the missing woman. 
At one point during the search, the Meehans actually brought in a helicopter to aid in their quest to find their daughter, but to no avail. As Circle was approximately 300 miles from Meehan's home in Bozeman, both her family and local authorities couldn't even come up with an explainable reason for why she wouldn't would have been in the area in the first place or where she would have been going while there. The most common thought behind what happened to me him that night is that she developed amnesia as a result of brain trauma during the accident. It's a theory that it, that does make sense. Many individuals who suffer from post-traumatic amnesia enter a state of confusion and disorientation immediately following any trauma. And they're usually unable to remember the events that happened immediately afterwards. Uh, so it talks a little bit about that. Uh, police also wondered if Meehan made her way out of the area by hiding in a hay truck that had been parked about a half a mile from the scene of the accident, whether on purpose or because she climbed in for shelter and earlier lost con- and either lost consciousness or fell asleep. They also believe she may have hitchhiked out of the area. And through the Pacific Northwest, as there have been multiple sightings of her at various truck stops between Montana and Seattle. One way. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. One waitress, Barbara Clements, says she saw Meehan sitting in the restaurant where she worked, noting she was acting very strange. She said Meehan sat at the table for over an hour and a half, mainly just watching other people as they walked by, watching as other people walked by as she talked to herself. I felt like she didn't know where she was or who she was. Another waitress, Barb Ruff, claimed. She even saw Meehan in the town of Bozeman in May 1989. She said Meehan was in a hurry to get breakfast, but when Ruff asked why, Meehan only said that she was going shopping. Since she disappeared, there have been over 5,000 alleged sightings of Meehan, and some actually have been confirmed by police. Still, her parents said they have not heard a single word from their daughter since the disappearance, though they do hold on to the hope that she is alive and well. Her father, Thomas Meehan, said, more than anything else in the world, I want her back with us, and we would not know that she was, and we would then know that she was safe. Not knowing who she is taking a ride from, that's my biggest worry, and I just pray day in and day out that she's with good people. Wow, that's Mm. bizarre. Yeah, just a bit. (laughs) Like, I don't even know what to say about that. Yeah. Yeah, I don't either. I was honestly, like, prepared to just say this. She's had a really bad mental health episode. Yeah was in shock and you know things like that but the fact that they kept seeing her yeah at at truck stops and things and like that yeah yeah that that certainly makes it uh, extra bizarre and 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 how is she affording things right right you know it's just yeah i don't (laughs) i have no idea just ran away and started a new life somehow or yeah yeah but again why is she seen so much i mean you would think Right. You're trying to be secretive about it or yeah. something. It's all, almost has like a ring of like a uh, witness protection sort of thing to it, except like there's the origins are completely different. <laughs> she said she was going shopping. Yeah. Yep. Mm. So according to the Wikipedia entry, she was featured on unsolved mysteries in the fall of 1989. And mm. they, they, it says they still have no idea. Mm. Wow. You know, the difference in, uh, interconnectivity of law enforcement and things like that just made this stuff so hard back in the day because it, it was non-existent really forever. And and even now it, it's, I think it's pretty convoluted and, you know, there's so much to sift through, but, um, you know, you're still doing stuff by mail, sending documents back and forth and things like that. Yeah. yeah just to say, Hey, uh, saw somebody that was blonde haired this height, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, and so that adds an extra challenge to all this of, uh, you know, awareness, I suppose, is uh, what I'm looking for there. And with those kids that disappeared in the forest, you know, you have the serial killer admitting to it, but the bodies are not where he says they are. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So is he just doing that to kind of buff up his, uh, yeah, I killed all these people. Right. Which, yeah, I was which I'm sure happens. Oh, I think I, a lot of serial killers do that. Yeah. Yeah. When we're talking about that, that other uh, serial killer who was responsible for all those kids in California, it made me think, like, it, would it be possible that somebody was claiming these things just, I don't know, like to, to get like some kind of a, I don't know, like some sort of attention or or reputation, you know, something like that. Maybe, you know, a reward. Yeah. Which, I think so. I think that certainly happens. Uh, you know, even the whole idea of like, you know, I'll, I'll admit to these other things. If you make my sentence, this 
Although he has to be executed. Yeah. Uh, but but I, I, I don't know. Um, Wasn't there a guy who admitted to doing like all kinds of killings all across the U.S. and they have no idea if he actually did them? Yes. Yes. I, I, I'm trying familiar. to remember the guy's name. I know who you're talking about. Yeah. Because, uh, I mean, it's like he's claimed to kill hundreds of people. Yeah. Uh, and, and they're like, generally just like, there's no way you did this. It's like the logistics of all this are incredible. Because I think he even but, claimed to be the Zodiac killer, too, or something, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I think did they even like kind of decide he was just delusional. Yeah. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. You know, so all this made me think of uh, uh, the Mindhunters uh, series that was, I think it was on Netflix. <laughs> yeah. Yep, uh, and it is sort of a, a dramatization of the FBI coming up with the concept of or to kind of breaking the idea down of serial killers, um, and they even have some story points where they run into people that are taking credit for murders that they did not commit. Hmm. Yeah, and that's that's always fascinating. Yeah, you know, it's not something you would think. Uh, anybody would want that kind of clout, but I suppose if you're in a, a different headspace, yeah. um, you know, hmm. yeah, look at all these people I killed. doesn't matter if you killed them or not. Just brag about yeah. it anyway. Yeah. Okay. Yes. The notches on my belt. Uh, especially, especially if you're, you, if you did kill people and you're going to jail, you know, might, might as well just make yourself look even more villainous. Yeah. I think that's it. Yeah. So, yeah. I did all this stuff. It's like, wait, what? That's a weird mindset. You'd have to be into. Yeah. I don't know. I just can't even so, imagine. So when you look at those, those kids who disappeared in that, that woods that we started with there, you know, the two who, you know, you found the bicycle and the jacket. Yeah. Okay. A serial killer makes sense there. It's the other one where, you know, like how far ahead was he on the trail, mm -hmm. you know, for someone right. to grab him without making any noise. I mean, he's a small kid. He's not, you know, a, a normal size adult probably could have carried him off pretty quickly, but you would think you wouldn't do it in that risky of a situation if they were that close behind him. Right, right. But, yeah. if, he, but if he did, it's also, you know, says it can be done. So how many of these other disappearances where someone was right ahead of them or right behind them on a trail – was a serial killer just grabbing them a human, you know? Yeah. If you had your escape route planned out and everything, and you were laying in wait like a, a spider, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's very possible. Um, I will say one other thing to throw out here. Um, one of the guys I grew up with, I, I won't go into any other detail beyond that. Cause I don't, necessarily have permission to share the story, but I think if I'm general about it, it's okay. Sure. Uh, he and his family like to go hike while he was growing up. And it's a lot like the, the second story where he got ahead of his family late in the day and, um, got separated from them somehow. And he was one of the first people that got me into the anomalous because he was sort of trying to process what had gone on. But his big thing was, he lost about like eight hours of time between, uh, you know, rounding the corner from them to when the park ranger found him, huh. uh, you know, early in the morning, mm -hmm. he'd been out the whole night and he was like, I, I felt like I was gone an hour. And, uh, so, you know, whatever that effect the forest has on you is, is powerful too. Um, and I don't know if that's a survival mode that something, uh, you know, in our lizard brain that kicks in or, or what, but, um, uh, it, it certainly messed with him to the point where he was searching all over for explanations for it. Yeah. Hmm. Huh. Yeah. That, that sounds like a, a time slip. It, it does. It does. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, he was the first person that I knew that, uh, looked at like abduction experiences and all these other things from a scholarly perspective. And it was all because of him trying to make sense of that uh, instance that happened when he was like 12. Yeah. Of his own experience. That makes sense. Yeah. Hmm. Um, I don't think we have time for another story. There's a bunch more I marked in the book, but we're running out of time. 
Uh, maybe we'll do one in the Patreon segment. Uh, but it's 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 a decently written book. Of course, you know now as we're we're researching this stuff, it turns out that either they're still unsolved or you know we figured them out. Yeah, which is interesting too, because you know, I mean, sometimes there's closure with these things. Yeah, and for it, the family or yeah. And it's interesting when there's there's you know when the stuff is still weird, like the the attorney there. It's like oh, we still don't know what happened. You know. <laughs> Right, right. Like this information doesn't, it's like it doesn't quite match up to reality in some way. And of course, the website I was reading it from is like, well, he was dead the whole time. He was a full body. It's like, okay, well, we don't know that. <laughs> right, yeah, we don't. Exactly. We don't. This is the problem. It's not possible. We just don't know. <laughs> right, right. It's, it's certainly a possibility because we don't know what happened. Um, it's also possible that maybe people were, were wrong enough about the time frames. Right. Uh, that maybe, yeah, maybe he climbed out of the car, went to the hotel in a daze and then came back, you know, who the hell knows, but why was he at the hospital saying he felt dead before he was in the accident? Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, they didn't say he was muddy or anything like that. I so weird. Yeah, it is. All right. Taylor, where can people find you? Oh, at the moment, um, greenlinepublishing.com and pretty soon there will be another website, uh, but that's where I'm at now. Okay. Uh, super inframan. If people want to communicate with you, uh, I, I hang out in the discord some, and you can always find me on Instagram under uh super scoop, excuse me, <laughs> super <laughs> underscore inframan, super inframan, <laughs> scoofer inframan. That's uh, <laughs> that, yeah. that, that's the uh, the uh, uh, much more fashionable bougie version of yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we do have a dis you, and you're talking about the discord for the last exit, uh, last exit for where did the road go? <laughs> Yes, and yes, yes. You can find the link to that on where the road go.com along with all our other social media. And Chris, where's uh what's your website? Oh, you can just well you can go to brightrectangle.com, but you can just go just go to the uh where the road go Patreon and uh uh sign up and uh give Soraya some money. Hundred <laughs> percent that's the best way to, to meet yeah. Chris. And yes, I and I the and best I, way to meet me. And Patreons, you guys are the best because uh it, it really helps me keep this show going. Um the uh but chris's films are also really cool yeah and i'm i'm there's one right now that i'm making about uh uh it's sort of uh the subject is this strange man uh <laughs> who has a show <laughs> yeah no i'm uh i'm making a i'm making a film sort of about sarai and the uh the where did the road go uh milieu so at some point people will be able to see that through 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 the where did the road go patreon first i, I would assume cool all right thank you guys thank you Thank you. Thank you. I would like to take a moment here to thank all of my Patreons, because without you, this show would not be possible. I particularly want to give a special shout out to those of you pledging $10 or more. Leanne Sherry, Allison Cook, Super Inframan, Stephen St. George, CJ, Tim, Andrew Nichols, Matthew Sproul, Christine, a blue second-gen MR2 drifting around a Japanese mountain, Patricia Gaiaquinta, Alex Whitcomb, American Rambler, Andrew Maines, Barbara Fisher, Beverly Williamson, Big Boy Limina, Brendan William, Charles Davis, Bobby Bear, MJ Armstrong, Charles in Florida, Land of the Crazy Incommunicable, Chris Ernst, Craig Cicernos, Craig Parmenter, Crystal Ann Compton, Diane B., Duffy Doubter, Edu Camahort, MTK, Eric Citron, Eric Todd, J. Otto Bullet, James Lattimore, Joanna Rojas, John Bracken, Carla Mahoney, Kevin, Kevin Shrek, Kristen L., Laser Printer Jam, Linz Jackson K., Luke Osborne, Jim and Sophie, Mark Bowley, Mark Brady, Matt in Delaware, Patricia W., Paul Jeffries, Ray Benedetto, Riker and Stark, Roger Gonzalez, Sam Sharon, Stone Wilderness, Tactical Therapist, Taylor Bell, 36 Dingo, Thunderboy, Timothy Castaneda, Tyler Glimstead, Vincent Trewell, Walker, Will Gebhard, Will Powell, Ren Collier, Stephen D., and Amber Hall. Thank you all so very much. There is a lengthy Patreon segment that goes along with the show where we cover more cases from the book, and I'm sure we'll be doing a part two of this sometime soon.
If you want to become a patron, we're at theroadgo.com, and it's only $3 a month. You get extra content all month long, and the show's a week early. And I'll see you next time. You have been listening to Where Did the Road Go? This show is made possible in part from our Patreons, and we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this exploration of the strange. You can always find everything Where Did the Road Go related at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And thank you so much for your support.